chapter of the book of Matthew, and we ran out of time then, and I'd like to conclude that. If for those that were taking notes, you noticed that we were noticing one idea or thought uh, that could be developed into a lesson out of each chapter in the book of Matthew. And we were in chapter, uh, ready for chapter 18 and verse 3. That's the verse I chose that works out well for a lesson text or sermon text where Jesus taught, except ye turn and become as little children, ye shall in no uh, wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, you can milk that for all it's worth. You also get an idea of the word repentance in the sense of except ye turn. The idea of little children's innocence. Uh, as we've said many, many times, children get all upset with one another and one having the other crying or both having them crying or there are two of them into it with one another. And yet in just a matter of a little while, they can be right back. Everything's forgotten and they're happy again. It's the state of innocence that must be in one in order to become a Christian. So since an adult has already gone past that, then there is the turning that the adult must do in the meaning of repentance, except you turn and become as little children. You shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. It also destroys the idea that a child of God is born totally depraved, having inherited Adam's original sin and is inclined to no good thing at all. Several things you could bring out about that. Then in chapter 19, I chose verse 6. What therefore God hath joined together, of course, he's talking about marriage, let not man put asunder. Uh, I constantly get questions and just finished answering one this morning on that very thing. Uh, as much teaching as was done on it back in the 70s and early 80s, uh, we think that, well, that stuck with everybody. But uh, 70s, late 70s was 40 years ago. And, 35 and 30 years ago, and a whole generation has grown up, and few people, due to the uh, situation we're in in our society today, have really been taught on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Uh, the thing that ought to be understood here is that upon the agreement of two people, a man and a woman, to be married, and they're holding themselves forward from a certain point forward, uh, to be husband and wife, and God joins them together. So there are actually three wills involved in the marriage. The man that's marrying the woman, the woman that's marrying the man, and God's will. And thus, the force of let not men put asunder, people don't realize it, but let is a command. And you can't put asunder what God joins together anyway, unless the exception of Matthew 19, 9, where one spouse commits fornication, even then, it's not a must situation. If the two could continue on in the marriage, forgiveness take place, trust be rebuilt, that's what really ought to happen. Because once uh, a divorce of Matthew 99 takes place, then the one that's guilty and been put away has no authority to join in a marriage, a God-joined marriage of Matthew 19.6. But nevertheless, that's another reason for teaching on Matthew 19, 6, and that part of it. In chapter 20, uh, you look at verses 1 through 26, and you see, uh, you see what's found. It has to do with working in the Lord's vineyard. We sing the old song, I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. Um, notice there's a reward for the one who does as the master wishes in his vineyard. And thus, a great lesson can be developed out of that concerning acting only as the master authorizes. It is his vineyard, and you're working in it according to his will. Then coming down to chapter 22, 37 through 39, you have him discussing the two great commandments. Uh, the first and the great commandment is to love Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And then the second uh, being, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, uh, you wouldn't have the problem that's been going on the last, uh, well, even about that fight last night across the road at uh, uh, Sports Bar. 
or any other thing like that, or all these riots that have been going on, if people would abide by the golden rule, whatsoever you would mention doing to you, do you also unto them. And if you love your neighbor yourself, that'll solve all of it. It doesn't mean that you have to like everything about everybody. Nobody does that. But it means that you're not going to do them any ill will, and they're not going to do you any ill will, that you wish them the best and you labor to bring that about. Then in chapter 23, verse 33, he talks about our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Uh, if not, we'll share in their condemnation. And of course, when you study all that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John has to say about how the Pharisees acted, they were nothing but hypocrites and hard-hearted, and they cherished their traditions more than the law of Moses. In fact, Christ said, uh, you worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, which was their traditions. They held to those more closely than they did what the law of Moses actually said. And then in chapter 24, verse 35, uh, Jesus let us know that heaven and earth shall pass away, but the Lord's words would not pass away. Well, that's a great comfort to me. We live in a society that's been growing more secular every year, all my life virtually, and it's full of materialism. People don't give any thought at all about death and uh, the judgment, and they don't believe in heaven or hell. They just think about what there is right now, and they see all this turmoil that's in the world, but yet that's always been in the world. Uh, what gives us something to hold on to? Well, it's the Word of God, and it's not going to pass away. Well, think of all of the truth that's in the Word of God that Christians have to hold to, and I don't know whether any of you have been visiting with people uh, very much concerning all the mess in the United States, concerning the COVID-19, and then all this writing and stuff, but people who have no belief in God, no idea of Christianity, no confidence in the Word of God, they're very troubled, and what bothers me is that it uh, gets over into the church. I read a posting not long ago from a member of the church. You had thought that the person had no hope whatsoever, no God at all to help them. But the Bible's full of material. Those brethren in the first, uh, the first uh, century had to have something like that. And uh, we do, and we will to the end of time. So there's a great lesson in Matthew 24, and verse 35. Then, of course, concerning our own death, which is certain, and the coming of the Lord, you'll see that he made it clear that we must always be ready because we don't know when the Lord's coming back. In an hour when you think not, the Son of Man cometh, 24 verse 44. Uh, one thing I always think about it, these people trying to predict the time of his coming, when they predict that time, you can be pretty sure that's not when it's going to be because he's going to come and nobody's thinking about it. But the point is, you must be ready all the time. Well, how can a person be ready all the time? God's ordained a gospel system that when you obey it and your past sins are remitted through the blood of Christ, the waters of baptism, he adds you to the realm of the saved, the church, and you live daily being faithful to him, you're ready. And you can't get more readier than that. That's being ready. And, of course, what bothers us, and we've got to learn how to deal with it, is uh, we all know our shortcomings. We all know our need for growth and development. We all know we make mistakes. Well, if we could live here a thousand years and know the Bible as well as the Apostle Paul, we would still be able to say, just like he said, I have not yet attained. But there's one thing I do. Part of being faithful is that you're always striving for greater knowledge. You're always uh, doing your best to bring your life in subjection to what you know, to learn more, to be willing to keep a heart tender that the Word of God can prick it. You're always trusting when you've done all you can to obey the truth that God's favor will make up the difference, and that's the key. If you don't watch out, you get into a state of trying to merit salvation. Well, you can't do that. Nobody can merit salvation. 
Uh, just because a man is as faithful as it's possible for him to be faithful in the church it has nothing to do with meriting salvation. It just means you're in the realm where you'll enjoy God's favor. That we don't deserve and cannot merit, cannot earn, but that through faithful obedience to the gospel and adherence to his will every day, we enjoy for the blood of Christ continually cleanses us from our sins as we walk in the light as he is in the light. First John 1 and verse 7. Then in chapter 26, verses 26 through 29, uh, we have uh, the picture given by our Lord of the uh, death of our Lord. We have the privilege, it is a duty, but it's a great privilege of observing the supper of the Lord as he teaches us in the New Testament. We assemble with saints of like precious faith, our minds in the worship assembly of the first day of the week is centered on God to worship him in spirit and in truth. We sing praises to him in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in our heart to the Lord. We have planned beforehand to give as we've been prospered, cheerfully without grudging, for God loves a cheerful giver. We want to grow in that grace also. We engage in prayer and supplication together in that wonderful unity of the saints. We are involved in the study of God's word. And then, of course, the Lord's Supper, which shows forth his death till he come again. And when we're partaking of the emblems of the Lord's Supper, our minds being guided by the truth, then we're thinking about what all Christ did for us in suffering on the cross. So what a privilege that is. When you think about it, there are very few people in the world who have the right to do that. So therefore, there's a great lesson in that. Um, another thing, too, uh, Christ was not the last good man in the true sense of the biblical definition of spiritual good to be persecuted because of envy. Envy, chapter 27, verse 18. 27, verse 18. Uh, a lot of things take place because somebody envies somebody else. And we ought to realize that that can take place even in the church with the wrong attitudes of uh, brethren toward one another. But we don't let envy or we don't let jealousy, we don't let those things stop us from doing what we know is right. And what we know is right is what the Bible teaches. So it may hurt our feelings, it will. And we may be sorry people are that way in whatever sin they get themselves into. But one thing to always remember, you're not responsible for every sin everybody in the world commits. Uh, that is, you're not even responsible for trying to straighten them all out. You do what you can where you are with what you have to do with. And if every member of the church worldwide was doing that, then the influence for good would be there. Truth would be preached and defended. So we must realize that. We see people every day who don't give any thought whatsoever to their spiritual condition. They don't think about God, Christ, the Bible, anything but flesh. And we're sorry for that. We look for opportunities to get them to realize this life is so brief and uncertain in flesh and death and judgment is sure. And you can't even get people to, to think about it with you. But nevertheless, that should not stop us because of other people's sins, whether it's envy or whatever it is, from doing what God said in our own lives. In chapter 27, verse 22, we have a question. What then shall I do unto Jesus who is called the Christ? And you'll remember that that was Pilate's own question to the Jews. They desired Barabbas rather than Jesus. And of course, their answer was crucify him, crucify him. We need to ask ourselves that question. What am I going to do with Jesus? And we sing a song sometime that reminds us of that when Jesus taught the saying that was called to be a hard saying, and many of his disciples turned back and walked no more with him, and Jesus turned to his apostles and said, will you also go away? And, uh, you know, you can't leave one place without going somewhere else. And Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. We believe and know that thou art God, uh, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So uh, we must always realize that if we leave, 
the truth of the gospel decide that we don't want it anymore. You're going to go somewhere, and where are you going? You don't just turn from one thing and leave without going somewhere else. Uh, we need to remember, and this could tie back into the observance of the Lord's Supper properly, that on the cross our Lord was wounded, not for anything he did that uh, made him deserve it, but for your transgression and my transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our sins was laid upon him, according to the great Messianic prophet Isaiah in chapter 53. So when we're observing the Lord's Supper and taking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we need to be remembering his suffering and knowing that all was brought upon him because of his love for us and that he's undergoing that when we should. So he did it for us because he was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, Thus, he's the Lamb of God that could go to the cross and die for the sins of the whole world. But we don't have to stop at the death of Christ, and this is the wonderful thing that we ought to meditate on more and more. Uh, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. But he's already promised a resurrection because he's been raised from the dead. And if there were no resurrection of Christ from the dead, Paul says that we'd be of all men most pitiable. In chapter 28, verse 6 of Matthew's, where he deals with that, we should all be thankful that someday we'll be raised again in a, a glorified body like our Lord has at this present time. And that is, that if that doesn't encourage you to be more determined, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, then uh, what could? So Romans 8, 24 says we're saved by hope. We're saved by the expectation that we earnestly desire to receive of the resurrection from the dead to eternal life. In chapter 27, 11 through 15, uh, you see that if you don't believe in Christ, then you don't believe in his uh, death, burial, and resurrection, especially his resurrection. Now, how are you going to explain the empty tomb? Somebody might say, well, you can't trust uh, Matthew to be writing the truth on that. Well, why? I listened to a fellow today who was uh, talking about things pertaining to the first century. And he was talking about Herod the Great in particular. And he was talking about when Herod decided to kill the children of Bethlehem, two years old and under. And he was saying, well, the only account we have of anything like that about Herod is just by Matthew. And so we don't even know whether that really happened or not. And yet he turned right around and mentioned Josephus is one of his chief sources about a lot of things that Herod did. And he had no problem whatsoever saying that was satisfactory. Well, he only read that in Josephus. Why does he have so much more trust in Josephus and what he said about Herod than did about what Matthew said about Herod. There's no reason to. So when somebody makes an affirmation like that, then that fellow has to prove that Matthew lied uh, on things, and that would be true of the resurrection. But when you have what Matthew said, then all the other people that uh, lived at that time who witnessed Christ and witnessed his resurrected body and all that thing, and uh, they were willing to die rather and suffer great affliction, persecution, rather than to deny that he was raised from the dead, that ought to make any rationally minded, honest-hearted person sit up and take notice. And thus, there's a great lesson in that in chapter 27 of Matthew, verses 11 through 15. And last from Matthew is that it's a, a great privilege a great honor. Yes, it's a duty and obligation, but it's a privilege and honor to teach all nations the gospel of Jesus Christ, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever is commanded, knowing he'll be with us always, even in the end of the world. Verse 19 of Matthew 28. Uh, we in the church need to remember that while we're battling errors in the church, even as Paul did, we still have a great obligation to be concerned about those who never heard the gospel and to do all we can to get the gospel to them. 
Uh, I don't guess anybody ever fought false teachers any more than the Apostle Paul did, but he did it while he was taking the gospel of those who never heard him. And we should emulate him and realize that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus uh, taught the truth to those that loved it and those that didn't, while all the time refusing the, hypo hypo uh, the hypocritical actions of the Pharisees and others. But he still set out the truth. And that's what the church is all about. So that's the way that I did the book of Matthew and looking at each chapter and coming up with lessons. You could find, of course, many other lessons. But I would suggest a good way of studying a book is to look at each chapter and say, now, what can I come up with out of this chapter that would be uh, great lessons that are so fundamental and so basic, but so needful when it comes to teaching? Now, let's uh, leave that, and we'll follow the same format as we go to the book of Mark. Mark, of course, has 16 chapters in it, but there's a whole lot in those 16 chapters. And you'll remember in Matthew, we looked at um, a key verse. We'll do the same thing with Mark. First of all, before I get to the key verse, it's been called, as I mentioned earlier, the gospel account to the Romans. And we'll talk a little more about that as we go through it. The key verse is, I'll, I'll call a key verse, you might differ, but chapter 10 and verse 45. Chapter 10, verse 45. For well, the Son of Man also came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Just think of what's embodied in that statement and the multitudinous details that are involved in his life when he did that. And that should tell us as members of the spiritual body of Christ that we're to be doing the same thing. We give our bodies, yield our bodies as living sacrifices. Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, which is our reasonable service. He gave his own fleshly body uh, for us. We as members of his church, having received remission of sins and obedience to the gospel and being added to that church by the Lord, then we in a, are in a position to minister unto others and to give our lives, not that people can have forgiveness of sins because of our life, like with Christ's life, but to sound out the gospel, to be a leavening influence for good, to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth. And that's where we must recognize the godly, righteous examples that we set. There are some key words in the book of Mark. I found this interesting, that uh, there are three of them we'll look at. A straight way, immediately, forthwith. Straight way, immediately, forthwith. All of these translate the same Greek word, euthus, transliterated as E-U-T-H-U-S, E-U-T-H-U-S, euthus. Mark uses that word 42 times, more than all the rest of the New Testament writers combined. Now, why did inspiration have him do that? Because let's pause here and say again, God wrote the Bible. Mark was inspired of the Holy Spirit, just like the Apostle Matthew was. And so God had him do it. Since God doesn't do anything without a reason, since the revelation of God's word for our benefit, why would he have him do that? Well, think of the meanings of straightway and immediately and forthwith. It means get up and get with it. There's a job to be done. There's no time to laze around. Uh, it reminds you of work for the night is coming when man's work is done. So there's only one life to live, and the minutes, hours, days, months, years all tick by. And as James says, our life's like a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanisheth away. So we have a lot to be doing straightway and to do it immediately and to forthwith get busy. So I think it's interesting that, that's, that Mark uses that word, euthus, 42 times more than anybody else in the New Testament of the New Testament writers. And the key thought, I'll just use chapter 1 and verse 1, Mark 1, verse 1. 
the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, look how simple that is, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yet, when you begin to contemplate the implications of that, and then you study the rest of the Bible, especially the New Testament, that is filled with so much information. Uh, you could just expect that the gospel came into the world. There had to be a beginning. And when the gospel is preached in its fullness for the first time, you go to the day the church started, as Luke records in Acts chapter 2. So I choose that thought as the key thought of Matthew, or rather Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And don't forget that gospel means good news, glad tidings. Well, why? Well, just think of what the gospel is. It's the power of God to save us from our sins, Romans 1, 16. That's not good news. I don't know what is, because Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Jesus made it very clear that if you die in your sins, you cannot be in heaven. There is but uh, one place to go besides heaven when you die, and that's eternal torment in hell. So we want to be sure that we know and that we abide in and that we teach and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at a little background as time will allow. Uh, and, and maybe we'll get into some introductory matters. Uh, first of all, the author himself, the, the book doesn't say who wrote it any more than the epistle of the Hebrew says who wrote it. But I'll remind you again, like I always do, and like we did last week when we started Matthew, God wrote the Bible. So regardless of the human that he used, he caused that person supernaturally to infallibly write down what he wanted him to write down. Um, a fellow by the name of Gundry, G-U-N-D-R-Y, had this to say, so we depend on early tradition and internal evidence for questions of authorship. Again, I think I said last week that I don't pay too much attention to all of that. I think it's good to know it. It's part of being able to answer people when they ask questions concerning authorship. But when you already have proven the Bible is the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, then what difference does it make what hand wrote it down? Um, from all that we can learn, you can read any commentary you want to, or you go back and read all the so-called early church fathers. And it's like H.C. Thiessen said, the evidence for the Markian authorship is early and unanimous. In other words, if you go back as far as you want to with what's uh, extant, and you'll see that they all thought, thought it was uh, Mark that wrote it. Let's look a little bit at, at Mark's name. Uh, we've been calling him Mark, but of course we come across, if you're familiar with it, John Mark. Well, John is his Hebrew name. Anybody have any idea what it meant? Well, John meant grace. The Hebrew for John is uh, grace or favor. Marcus was his Latin surname, Acts 12 and verse 12. And they would do this, the Jews would do it, they would use among themselves their Jewish names. When they got out among the Gentiles, then they had other names. It doesn't take long to read about the ancient Romans and you can remember one in particular who was called uh, Mark Antony. You sure know that. One of the Caesars was Marcus Aurelius. So it was a common name, and it was the Jewish custom to simply refer to John as John among themselves, but Mark when he was among the Gentiles uh, as a Roman name. What did the Roman name mean? Well, it meant hammer. It meant hammer. So he was a favorite hammer, I guess you could say. 
John meant favor and Mark meant hammer. What about his family? Well, we have to put together several things because it doesn't just come out and say, now we're going to discuss his family and all that. It just doesn't do it. But the best we can figure out is that his mother, John Mark's mother, was a well-to-do disciple whose name was Mary, Acts 12 and verse 12. His father's never mentioned, so it's assumed that his mother was a widow. You remember that he had a cousin by the name of Barnabas. And of course, he accompanied Paul on first great preaching tour, Colossians 4 and verse 10. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Mark's home was in Jerusalem itself. Of course, therein was the church established. And you'll see that it was being where the church began, a rallying point for the early church as far as Mark's home is concerned, Acts 12 and verse 12 again. Now, when you start reading all about this, you'll see that some scholars think this was uh, the site of the upper room where the Lord observed the Passover and instituted the Lord's Supper, um, where he also appeared to them uh, following his resurrection. That's all conjecture based upon maybe some evidence. Certainly, if you read Acts 12, verses 12 through 14, we can conclude that that home reflected comfortable financial circumstances. Uh, it was large enough to accommodate, according to the scriptures, many disciples. It had a gate and it had an inner court and they had at least one household servant. We know that Peter was in that home often, and when he was freed from prison by the angel, he immediately went there. And uh, that ties in with the other comments we've made about the disciples sort of anchoring there at that house that housed a lot of disciples. Peter was so frequent in his visiting there and as he stood outside knocking at the door, the maid was so surprised and astonished that she recognized Peter's voice, Acts 12, 12 through 14, and went back and told them, uh, which you see some of the Jewish superstitions and thinking that they'd already decided he was dead, and that was his angel out there knocking. But of course, that shows how brethren are that they're much like us. They're in there praying that for Peter, James, the brother of John's already been killed with the sword. Herod saw that that pleased the Jews, so he took Peter. And they no doubt thought, well, this is the end of Peter. So I'd like to have heard some of those prayers offered on behalf of Peter. But God wasn't through with Peter. That raises a lot of questions. Why did James, why did God uh, decide that it was time for James to die? And all the other apostles continued on for some time. Well, that's in the divine precincts of heaven. None of our business, really. It's thought by some that Mark was that young man in Gethsemane at the time of the arrest of Christ who ran out of his clothes, Mark 14, verses 51 and 52. Um, if Jesus and his band had met for the Last Supper in the house, and notice all the ifs that are here, um, if they were in the house that was John's home, Mark's home, then that may have been one reason that Mark followed uh, them out to Gethsemane and was uh, there in the loose dressing that they wore at that time. It'd be very easy to come out of your clothes in those days for the way that they dressed. Now, we get the idea he ran away uh, start naked, but you got to realize naked did not mean he had no stitch of clothing on at all, that it meant his outer garments, that he was naked according to the biblical definition of naked, which most of the time people don't think about. So he could still had underwear on, if you want to call it that, when he ran out of his clothes, if that was Mark. We don't know that. But here's one thing about it. Only Mark could know such an incident 
and all the others ran away. Chapter 14, verse 50 of Mark, Mark 14, verse 50. Uh, I find it curious that these things are recorded, except that I know the Lord recorded them because they needed to be recorded. So what is it that he meant us to know? Well, maybe it's one of those small things it says. This is that Mark uh, who lived in that house where Jesus had observed the Passover and instituted the Lord's Supper. Who knows? But just remember, those people lived like we did in their culture, in their language, in their technology, just like we did. Now, what about uh, him as a young Christian? I don't know when he was converted, but I know Peter calls him son. 1 Peter 5, verse 13. 1 Peter 5, 13, you might compare that to Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, chapter 4 and verse 15, verse 15. Remember, Paul would talk about Timothy in that way, which evidently was a common way they had of when an older person had converted and baptized another person uh, or was instrumental in the conversion, that they talk about him, his son in the gospel. He was allowed, permitted, invited to accompany his cousin Barnabas and Saul, which again is the Jewish name for the Apostle Paul. Paul being, like Mark's name, was a Roman name. To Antioch of Syria, that says something about his dedication. That was in about 45, 45 AD, Acts chapter 12, and verse 25, Acts 12, 25. Now, both in Jerusalem, Mark's hometown, and in Antioch of Syria, think of what Mark had the privilege to witness when it came to the great preaching of the apostles and the first persecution of the Lord's church and the dedication and how that the gospel had sweeping success at that time. So even as a very young person, he'd experienced so much and was eyewitness to a great many things. Now, just a few more minutes. I want to end up with this. He did fail a test. And in studying about that, that might give us encouragement to know that you could make a uh, bad grade when you were tested in your faith and yet come back like he did. He accompanied Paul, had to be by invitation, and Barnabas on the first preaching tour, and that would have been around 48 AD, Acts 13, 2 through 5. So he went with them. He didn't go as a preacher, but he went as one to attend, wait on, if you please, an assistant or an apprentice to Barnabas and to Paul. Can you imagine what a thrill that must have been? Uh, it would have been very exciting, but there would also be uh, much danger. And it must have been startling, that young man, because at Perga of Asia Minor, we find it recorded that Mark turned back in a shameful way, Acts 13, verse 13. We don't know why. Sometimes I've just thought, he just got homesick. I can't prove that. Might have missed his girlfriend. I don't know. Uh, might have missed mama. If we're right about the other things, he came from a life of privilege, and to follow Paul around preaching the gospel, sometimes it, it didn't allow for that easy way of life. Paul always talked about his work for the Lord and being enduring hardship, as he said to Timothy, as a good soldier of the cross. Nevertheless, he left. And he left them when they were at Perga of Asia Minor. Paul's reaction to this later on proves that it was completely unacceptable to him that he left. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 40. Acts 15, 36 through 40. And all that came out when they were getting ready to go on the second journey. Again, we could talk about all kinds of possible reasons for the reason he went back. 
but it wouldn't do any good more than what I've already speculated. You may have others in your mind. But I do know this. To Paul, Mark's conduct was so inexcusable that he would not allow him to go on the second journey. Uh, Barnabas wanted to work with him. Paul said no. Uh, I suppose Paul looked at it from the standpoint he, we needed him. He was there for a reason. And he put his hand to the plow and looked back, Luke 9, 62, and he's not going with us. Well, he had no staying qualities. Um, he lacked the grace of perseverance. But it's always nice to know there can be second chances. Because in this second trip that was planned, Barnum's took him when the distinction became so sharp between he and Barnabas over where they take John Mark, Paul and Barnabas, that Barnabas took him and went to Cyprus, Acts 15, 36 through 40. Acts 15, 36 through 40. I think Paul's disagreement with Barnabas, knowing what we know from the scriptures about Paul's character, dedication, love of God, all those good qualities, means that Mark's early decision was inexcusable as far as Paul was concerned. Paul's logic was that a general cannot build his campaign on unreliable men. But now Barnabas argued that they must give a brother another chance. Now you say, how do you know all that went on? I don't know what all was said, but I've lived life. And I've lived among the brethren. And I know except for a different culture, a different technology, and a different language, they're the same human beings we are, and they do the same things we do. So Barnabas being kinsman, was willing to bear with him. Maybe decide to take him to Cyprus where it was easier going than where Paul was going. And that's in what happened. Another good lesson out of this, if two of the greatest faithful servants God ever knew in the church, God ever had in the church, could differ over a matter of option without trying to destroy one another, notice it's a matter of option, then certainly we can expect the same to happen today. And what happened? Two great journeys are formed rather than one. So each one of these men being adamant in their thinking, parted company. Paul took Silas traveled to Syria and visited the churches he and Barnabas had established beforehand. Syria, uh, he went through Cilicia, which would be going back to Paul's hometown. Barnabas took Mark, he went to Cyprus, and that was in about the year 51 AD. And so far as we know, scriptures are silent on this. They never worked together again. Now, last few words. There were some great productive years in the spread and defense of the gospel by these men. It was about 11 years later. And in those 11 years, we don't know anything that happened with Mark, except I think we can assume and assume correctly he was growing up mightily in the faith. Because in AD 62, Paul writes to the church in Colossae, from prison, and he said that Mark was with him. Colossians 4, verse 10. There's been some walls repaired somewhere down the road. And we see that he endor he's endorsed by Paul in his work in the gospel, that is, Mark was. And that Mark is called Paul's fellow worker in Philemon chapter 24, or verse 24. And that's a term used to describe at least used by Paul, to describe his proven helpers in the spread of the gospel. As Paul later waited the date of his own execution, he asked for Mark to come, and here's what he said, for he is useful to me for ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Now, Mark's done a lot of changing. That's the reason I said a while ago he failed his test, but he got another chance, and he came through in flying colors. That ought to tell every person in the church, simply because you blew it at one time because of frailties, don't quit. 
You don't lose unless you decide to quit. If you persevere, if you're steadfast, if you have a tender heart, if you repent of your sins, if you get back up and hit it again, you'll get there. In 1 Peter 5, 13, um, we find remarks of Mark, uh, of Mark about being with Peter. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because we mentioned Mark and Peter, Mark and Peter, Mark and Peter, because we have to stop here. And we're going to talk about the book itself, um, to whom it was written, so on, Lord willing, next week. So I hope this has been helpful to you. Maybe whetted your appetite to do more personal study in these areas. But this is how we'll have begun to study the book of Mark. And as I said, this will be the way that we'll continue this survey through the different books as time allows we continue in this format. So we'll call her quits right here and thank everybody for being with us. Wish everybody a, a good night.